Paul Salt. BBC Radio Merseyside. A very good afternoon. So we heard in yesterday's daily government coronavirus briefing that the UK death toll has now reached 29,427. The government figures suggest that it's now the highest death toll in Europe, overtaking Italy. So what does all this mean then? To help us understand, I'm joined now by Professor Tom Solomon from the University of Liverpool, who's the director of the UK's Emerging Infections Unit and a frontline doctor as well. Hello, Tom. Hi. Uh, First things first, a lot of people will hear those figures and quite rightly be very alarmed by them. Is it as simple as looking at the numbers and saying that the UK has the biggest problem? No, it's not that simple. I mean, I think it is obviously distressing to have so many deaths, 29,000 deaths. And it's very sad for all all the people involved. But I think comparisons across different countries in Europe, it's not that straightforward. Um, there are a number of factors which affect the number, although our, the crude number at 29,427 does make us now slightly higher than Italy, which was 29,315. But there's so many things involved. Um, we have a bigger population than Italy, so that's important. It's also important that different countries are, are testing in different ways and reporting in different ways. And clearly, if you don't test so many people, you're not going to report them as coronavirus deaths. So um, there, there are lots of different ways of looking at it. And um, we're also at different stages in the epidemic. But um, I think really, if you want to you know, look at these kind of figures, ultimately the best way to make comparisons is, is after an outbreak is over. And then what we do is we look at all the, all the deaths, not just those that are diagnosed with coronavirus, because that, like I said, that depends on how many you test. And we compare the deaths with, with what we know the average was from the past, so that's called the all-cause mortality. So right. it's a bit, it is a bit early to say, but it's clearly whatever the number is, it's worrying. And however it compares with Europe, it's you know it's a, it's a tragedy really. And maybe people will understand that you can't get a real verdict, as Dominic Raab put it, and, and, until the, the pandemic is over. However, should we not be trying to learn lessons as soon as possible? I think so. Yes, I think we can learn lessons by comparing our approach with the approaches in other parts of the world. And that, that's not just about counting how many people have died, but that's looking at how different parts of the world have brought the outbreak under control. And um, in Asia, in Southeast Asia, clearly things happened earlier there, so they're sort of further on in, in the story. Um, but they've done some really useful things. For example, the contact tracing that uh, we're now going to be setting up in this country using smartphones, uh, they've, they've been doing that for quite a while, and it's a very effective way of finding out who's infected so that then you don't need to have everybody in lockdown. You can just focus on isolating those who are infected and and their contacts. Looking in this country and indeed regionally in this country, it it was reported a couple of days ago that the North West has the highest number of deaths as London's London's figures have have, have sort of followed a downward curve now. Um, Will we get a downward curve happening here? And, And can you estimate when it might happen? Yeah, so it, it, what's happened in the northwest has been uh, two or three weeks behind what's happened in London throughout the whole of the ap- uh, epidemic. So their deaths are clearly dropping. Ours probably are, are peaking and dropping. I, I've just looked at the figures earlier. Uh, so the weekend, 24th of April, we had in the northwest 3,100 deaths. Uh, the week before that, it was closer to 3,200. So, so hopefully we are peaking and, and the number of deaths will, will be dropping. And that's what we would expect. And just looking at the figures, it is difficult to tell, but it looks like Liverpool has, has suffered quite badly, really, as a city, if you, if you look at the rates in terms yeah. of population. Yes, it seems that the number of cases uh, in Liverpool has been higher than some other cities. And it's not clear what the reason for that is, what specifically for Liverpool. We know, we know in general what makes uh, people more likely to become infected and we know what makes them more likely to have a bad outcome to die. So you know, maybe that some of those things do apply to our population. Certainly, um, we did actually, uh, based out of Liverpool, we, we led the largest national study. This was led by my colleagues. And that looked at 17,000 people with coronavirus. And we showed that across the country, people who were more likely to die were those who were obese and who had other conditions like heart and lung disease and diabetes, and then also those that were older. So those are, those are the national figures. We haven't sort of drilled down to see how much of that applies to Liverpool specifically. And of course, the other question Sorry. about Liverpool is whether we had an increased number of cases related to this football game in the middle of March. 
Well, that, that was actually... You've, you've, you just read my mind now. That was going to be my next qu- question. I mean, will we ever know what impact the Atletico Madrid game had on the figures? Well, we're, we're planning a study to, to look at it, and these are very hard uh, things to look at. But um, one of the things we're hoping to do is to uh, compare the risk of uh, developing coronavirus, the risk of being positive for... Uh, for example, the type of approaches you can do is, is, is look at the risk for Liverpool fans who were at that match compared with a, a comparator group. And the obvious comparison group would be, say, Everton fans who, who obviously didn't have a match that night. Um, so those are, those are the kind of epidemiological approaches that we're, we're wanting to do. And that, that might help us answer that question. And I do think it's a really important question because it will help us understand what's been happening in this city. Uh, just just finally, obviously, we're expecting some kind of announcement on Sunday from the Prime Minister regarding what might happen with the, the restrictions that are in place. With the daily numbers now starting to, to drop, do you, do you think there will be a big change in the restrictions? I think um, we, we're likely to see some changes. Um, it's very hard to predict exactly what. I think what, what's going to happen, the course, will be a small changes maybe every few weeks. You have to give it two or three weeks to see the impact of, of changes. In fact, one of the studies that we're running out of the call is a community study looking at transmission in households and we will be able to see what the effect of the changes are. But we have, I should mention, I've mentioned a couple of our studies in the report, but we've had a fantastic research response across the city, all the universities, the School of Tropical Medicine, the hospitals and the community working together. And we've had a fantastic response to our fundraising campaign to support that. So I think in some ways, Liverpool, I think at the end of this whole sorry story, uh, Liverpool in some ways will shine because of the response of the city in helping control the outbreak, not just here, but nationally and internationally. Thanks very much for talking to me. It's it's really helpful. Thanks for coming on. You're very welcome. Take care. Uh, Bye-bye. It's uh, quarter past two, BBC Radio Merseyside. BBC Radio Merseyside. Make a difference.